Hi, I'm Bart. Hi, I'm Bas. And we are a part of Tiny Giants, a 3D uh, animation studio based in the east of the Netherlands. And we focus on creating animations uh, for the commercial world. And what we try to do is we try to create as many cool creative products uh, in that world as possible. Um, and today we'll be talking particularly about production workflow that, production workflows that we use and how we use Cinema 4D uh, to quickly iterate our processes. Um, so I think for you guys to have an idea, it's pretty interesting to look at a show real quickly. So we put two together, or we had two, which we can walk through. Cool, so that was our uh, reel from 2020, uh, the commercial one. Let's dive into another one, which is uh, an older reel, but it's uh, more focused on our creative side. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, we pretty much like that, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's what we've been busy with for the past couple of years, um, mainly doing 3D productions. Um, and as we are a small studio, um, we think it's kind of important uh, that we are hugely flexible, um, that we can work quickly and that we can iterate a lot. Um, so we also require that from Cinema 4D, our main host software. Yeah, you can continue. Um, and that brings us to kind of how we work. Um, so we started out doing a lot of creative projects. Um, that's where the passion came from. I think we all started like that. 
And then we figured out that the commercial world is uh, obviously a better way to make money. Um, so we started working in there. But soon we realized that we really enjoy the creative part a lot more. And that part of that creative process is also that you want to be a bit more multidisciplinary. So 3D is a great tool, it's amazing, but often uh, a company might need a film or something else. Um, and crossing those things over is quite brilliant. So not too long ago, I think it's about two and a half years by now, we started a collective, um, which is also the building we're in right now. Uh, it's called New Imaging, and we produce all sorts of productions. Um, let's see. So we basically have illustration, uh, we do 3D animations, uh, we have more 2D animation somewhere, yes, 2D animation, uh, film, and we have photography. And that's actually kind of epic for us because it allows us to learn a lot more and to dive into these projects a lot deeper. So it allows us to get something filmed and do some VFX, something that we as a small team could never do. Um, without the need to hire someone or without the need to yeah, kind of uh, go cr make that crossover yourself, so lose your expertise in one particular field and then uh, go into another field. And that's actually very important to us and that brings us to how we distrib distribute yeah. that kind of work. So to tell you a little bit about our production workflows, um, our 3D production workflow revolves mainly around Cinema 4D. Um, that's why we're here tonight. Um, for some other more creative outbursts, we uh, tend and like to go to ZBrush and Houdini. Um, ZBrush mostly for sculpting of uh, characters or just very high mesh objects um, with a lot of realism and Houdini mainly for more intricate simulations where yeah we want to have the creative freedom that doesn't or that doesn't say at some point you reach the max of particles or anything so the sky is the limit there um, for rendering we mainly use Octane within Cinema 4D and our texture workflow for now is mainly uh, in Substance, Quixel and Rhythm UV uh, and we're hoping with the release of R22 to quickly adapt um, the new Cinema 4D into our workflow where we have the new renewed UV workflow. Um, on our post-production side, we mainly use the Adobe Suite. Um, our renders straight up go to After Effects to do basically the raw composition, uh, post-effects, and then do the editing music in Premiere. Uh, we use Illustrator to do more of the technical textures, so for example a, yeah, wire texture for a tire, for example, uh, and Photoshop, of course, for post-production of our still imagery. Next. So, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to talk about our production workflows and particularly what we like about cinema or how we use cinema. Um, and one of the main things out of that is takes. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Um, we'll talk about how cut import is important to our workflow, how Octane saves our asses here and there, um, why and how we believe keeping things procedural is important, uh, what MoGraph means to us, um, how we use the modeling tools, and how they're quite efficient for us, uh, using the volume measure, and talking a bit about X particles and how that can function in a workflow. Um, so to kick right off, um, we picked out a project which is something we've been working for for quite a while. Uh, it's Kitchen Appliances, one of our main clients, um, produces a lot of them. And we started about four years to work for uh, four years ago to work for these uh, these people. And it's been quite an interesting journey because at first you're uh, talking mainly about hey how do we get realism, uh, how do we put something together, and how do we uh, create a good and clear specification video and over time we've been just like they are we've been evolving uh, evolving 
and together we're trying to build bring these productions to the next level so that first meant hey let's add some more food um, let's add some more real food so in this case it's been plated um, which is not a bad thing but it's always a limitation so over time um, we try to go a bit further with every production that's also what is interesting about our collective of course that allows us to do it so the last production was a pretty interesting one because it was a crossover of the two disciplines it's also I think this production is three years later so I hope it looks like that too uh, and basically this production uh, involves a lot more emotion or emotion in this case food uh, you want to really get people hungry when they look at something like a, like an oven you want to sell it so you want to you want to make them enthusiastic so we sat together with the client and we talked a lot about hey what can we do and how can we do it um, so in this case that meant that we wanted to basically merge 3d and the real world so we filmed a lot of foods uh, in the oven specifically um, and then we brought it together in some shots where we actually merged the two worlds and you can see that in a bit so of course we kept the technical part in 3d because it's just easier to maintain but then again a pizza like this you could basically never do in 3d properly and i think this is already calmed and after this one you could also do in 3D, but well, we had the oven, so yeah. why not do it in film? Just pull a rope. Yeah, that was a pretty fun experience. And let's see. Yeah, for example, in the coming shot, we literally had to make a cooking lasagna inside a 3D oven. Uh, what we did is literally cut out the window of the lasagna or of the oven and uh, comp it in afterwards in 3D. So we basically have a time lapse uh, or at least a pre, during and after bake of the of the lasagna with some uh, steam effect on it and it sells. Exactly, that brings it all together, at least that's uh, what we're hoping for. Um, so I think it might be interesting to quickly dive into this project yes. to show how we use takes particularly. Yeah, so normally what happens when we get one of these jobs in is that we get a mood board and that is open this one. Yes. It's opening. Yes. Yeah. So we get a mood board of our client, which basically shows, first of all, the environment they would like the oven to be in. And automatically that is uh, an environment which uh, basically display, displays the brand in the best possible way. Uh, and the rest is mainly function of in this case the oven so it's a special oven with a, a microwave oven and a steam oven combined into one it's very important to them that we show all aspects of that and then it's basically technical specs of in this case the microwave that it can vary its wattage etc uh, etc et to quickly go into cinema 4d um, so Right away, when we start off with one of these product projects, we like to indeed design the kitchen. Quickly go to the main take. And as you can see here, we have a setup which basically shows you the kitchen we ended up with. So you see it's mainly useful for the region that we actually use. The rest no one sees, so why would we waste our time on it? And we basically start off modeling within cinema based on primitives. Everything is kind of straightforward. Uh, and where we have intricate things, we either like to buy an asset, like for example, these kitchen appliances, or 
if it adds something for us, create the object from scratch, like this tab here. And if we go to the PowerPoint back, oh, you can see, like, for example, we get a picture like this from the client. They have a tab they would like to have in the kitchen. Uh, we can search for a specific model of tap on any website that delivers pre-made models, but we can also model it ourselves within cinema. And we love modeling in cinema because it's so diverse, since you can model in a gazillion different ways. Uh, quickly take this tap. Yeah, so basically I see four or five shapes. You have the base, you have the actual tap, you have a knob with a stick on it, and you have a base. And if we go into cinema... Okay, a quick modeling intermezzo to go into detail a little bit more about how to model this tap. Um, we start off with a simple cylinder, primitive which we give two height segments and we go into a front view uh, make it editable by pressing C select all the polygons uh, go into the uh, line cut tool by pressing KK and uh, we want to say that indeed visible only is off and single line is on so we can start here, hold shift for a 45 degree angle, which is mentioned here. And do the same for the bottom. After which we can select these polygons, make sure only select visible elements is ticked off. So it also selects the ones in the back. And by holding control, you can drag this out as far as you want. After which you press T and scale on the x-axis. Okay. Now, if you would want to put this, for example, into a subdivision surface, as you can see, it doesn't give a result like a nice tap would be. So we want to add some cuts to the topology by pressing KL, you go into your loop slash path cut, and in the front view we can add the cuts here. At for example 10 centimeters, the same here, 10 centimeters. And you see that now the bevel or the shape the subdivision surface makes is a lot smoother. Now you want to put one at the top and one at the bottom and one here. Okay, now go back to our perspective view. And now we want to add some inner extrusions by first selecting with UL a loop and basically add the inside to the selection by pressing UF and invert it by pressing UI. Now we can inner extrude MW and I would say somewhere around five now we can get rid of these polys here by pressing delete and going back to the top and making another extra inner extrude hold control again to go down to create the hole for the actual tab later okay um, now I'm going to use a spline to create the actual tab. So I add a rectangle on the side. Like 
that. I make sure that it's editable by pressing C again and switch off the close spline. Now we have to rotate it 45 degrees and basically make your main shape by dragging it a bit up and down. Okay. Now we can go for a chamfer, which is I don't have a shortcut for, so you can always go for Shift C, and which is basically the most powerful shortcut in Cinema because you can search for anything. And right now we need a chamfer, which is basically a bevel for a spline. And now we have the base shape of a tap, which we now need to sweep. I create an end side, which is basically a circle with segments. So I'd say 16 sides, make it a little bit smaller, and add it to a sweep together with the shape of the tap. And we have a base shape. Go in a little bit. And now basically we have the start of that tap. Now back to the presentation. It's basically everything you see is doable with the shelf tools that Cinema 4D supplies. And here and there the shapes that you rather don't want to spend time on. For example this mixer. Of course you can model it in Cinema but for this project, since it's not the star piece of the animation, it was a bought item. This will uh, so after the whole modeling part of the scene, getting everything ready, you start putting your cameras in. Uh, so what is very important for us there is the takes workflow um, to dumb it down a bit. Basically what it does, it takes any value in cinema and you can assign multiple of those values to the same object. So for example, indeed for a camera, I can give it an animation in one take and in the other take it has a different animation. And this is very easy to keep somewhat of an overview in your scene instead of having multiple cameras on the same uh, timeline which can be very annoying I know from from experience from the past when this wasn't introduced yet it was a mess um, besides that there's a lot more you can do with the take system um, but Bart will tell you a little bit more while I quickly start up Octane to show you the step after this so the cool thing is, I mean, of course you can uh, you can do something about cameras in there, but more interesting, at least to us, is uh, let's say you need to have a shot where the door is open. You, if you don't use takes, you would either make a different uh, oven where the door is open, and then you make a different shot. But how would you save that shot? Do you make a new file, and it just quickly becomes a huge mess. But if you use the take system, it's all in one scene. You can just do those variables in there and you can keep everything. Uh, awesome thing is also in the save file, you have how they're called again. Um, you can specifically the Render tokens. Render tokens, exactly, a brilliant thing. Uh, so you could say, hey, I want my uh, images to be saved with that take name in, into account. Yeah, so the, the, the very amazing thing there is, let's say we indeed just had a main camera animation on the intro shot from frame 0 to 150 before the take system you had to to not screw up your um, file names you had to actually go above 150 with your new frames otherwise you would literally yeah. overwrite your whole system hey guys back with another quick intermezzo um, we figured that takes could use a little bit more explanation so let's show you around the basics of takes um, 
takes is pretty simple. Uh, it just gives you a chance to put a bunch of variables onto whatever you want. Um, let's put this in a grid array. Let's make this, this is very little to do with it. A random effector. Oh, oh, beautiful. And on top of that, oh, we put some more text saying, oh, oops, that's not automatic, that's only my settings. Whoops. Look at that. That's gorgeous. So, now we have this. Let's put a sphere in there too. And yes, yes, great. Do we want it like that? No, we want them in a no. Hop. Great. So now we have a basic setup out of which we have a Motex, which is randomly affected. It's beautiful. We have a cloner on grid. Uh, with a bit of randomness and we have spheres and we have cubes so the basic would be that we now create a child take we call this one sphere the text is already sphere so that's great we turn on the sphere and immediately see that we change this basic value to enabled and now we would probably want to have another take saying cubes that means that this one is completely fresh, it has nothing, we turn the cubes on, we change this parameter to cubes, and suddenly we have the same amazing look, but for cubes. Um, so, one thing that's kind of important is auto-take is on now, so if you would normally try to do this, everything is disabled, and you would need to click override to enable any variable, However, auto-take is kind of an amazing way to do it. On top of that, um, in bigger scenes, something that's very common is that you want to adjust the main take, but you don't want to keep on swapping like this. Um, you might just want to override the main take. So if you do that, you can click this button, which says go to the main take, and you could make this smaller and make this one a bunch smaller. Up, beautiful and as you can see that's now changed in all of them so you don't need to go back and forth all the time um, that's actually the basics of it and then on top of that there's another interesting feature which is if I would make this a child take I could also apply some render settings so I now have an output of 1280 by 720 I make one child take call it high res and I lock the ratio, make it eight times this res, and I apply that resolution to this take. Call it high res, and I could just put that on this one too. Let's assume my swap now. You can see that the tick mark swap as well. So this is a quite an easy and convenient way to manage your renders. Um, one quick warning practice when you do this before you apply it in big scenes because it can become quite chaotic if you don't know what you're doing um, but there you have it look at the basic scene the sphere scene and the cubes enjoy so basically after we did the camera animation we did the modeling we did the texturing we go into octane where we basically finish the scene off until the post step of course but um, Octane saves a lot of time for us uh, since we have these long-ish animations uh, which take up to three, four minutes sometimes, but we do need to produce it within a month or sometimes, if we're lucky, too. Uh, so then in that case, we try to limit our render times as much as possible uh, for this particular animation on this system it was around a minute uh, on our other render machine it took half a minute a frame uh, so there we're very lucky to use Octane speed wise so we don't have to wait for weeks uh, time to render out three to four four thousand frames um, I think now you have this cut model might be yes. interesting yes so uh -huh. basically when we 
first up, start out with these projects next to the whole um, look side and the uh, the product si side of the project we get a technical cut file so it basically means we have every little object um, these designers thought of to put on in this oven so you can see it's a lot and normally this is done in for example um, Siemen XT or Fusion 360 or SolidWorks or whatever other program you can name um, and we basically get random files um, I don't think it's in there, it's no. files only. I quickly have to open it. So, normally when, before when we would get these files, we had to either go into SolidWorks or Fusion 360, uh, upload them, let them be converted, import them, either export them as OBJ or STL, and then open them in Cinema 4D. Uh, since two versions we have a cut importer within Cinema 4D, so we can basically throw it, um, throw anything in there. So, for example, for a previous, yeah, we you basically get a step file uh, or whatever file they have from production, and we basically have all the settings we can get from the base file, which we can change. So we can actually if there are any uh, you can get the display color so we know what materials are which um, or you can randomly assign a color to it so you have a nice overview of what parts are separate um, if there are materials on there we can also import them um, uvs is not custom in most cad programs but if they are you can get them and then you can basically set your tessellation so the detail of the actual uh, mesh and basically import it into cinema this is gonna take a while so i guess we take a little break until it's imported now you want to wait for it actually it's not that long no simple stuff so yeah this is actually hugely bad like it's a huge improvement because it's one in our own program um it's quite a lot more efficient and let's say you have a more complicated product uh, where you do need to play around with hey do I want I do I want a high density mesh or do I want lower density mesh you just have those choices and you can just swap them around you can even make proxies if you want to and it's, uh, it's quite and, and, good. and let's say you want to actually zoom into certain parts of your oven or fridge or whatever uh, product you have it's also possible to say okay I want a certain amount of objects in low resolution because they're going to be in the background or I'm not going to zoom into them or whatever reason uh, and then the particular pieces that you are going to zoom into you can uh, import in either a medium or a higher uh, density mesh so that's very convenient but if you are a client or anyone else, don't think it's like, boom, done. Like, there is some manual work to this stuff. Yeah. We often experience that clients are giving us 3D models and expect it to instantly look pretty and be amazing. Uh, we all pretty much know that's not the case. It needs work. Uh, everything needs work. Um, the, yeah, the other day we got yeah. a 2.8 million poly tire in, like, use this, uh, I had to manually Retopo it from scratch, so that was very handy. And basically, once it, in, uh, it is imported, you basically have a relatively, yeah, of course, disregarding the uh, the tries, you have a clean mesh you can work with. And here and there, of course, you can retopologize whatever needs retopologizing. Uh, re uh, but for us, it's it's decent enough. Cool. Should we continue? Yes. Let's look at this one and then go there. Up. Oh. Yes. So, uh, on the one side we have this quite commercial side and on the other side, as we mentioned earlier, we do uh, more creative works and luckily we also find the clients to do that with us. 
And in this case, uh, this was an agency called Hart. They had a client called Recognize and they really wanted to introduce their brand story and new brand identity with some kind of cool teaser animation. So they started out uh, saying, hey, can't we do something about creating some matter? Uh, they found some animation that they really liked, uh, some parts of it at least. These wavy things were kind of their brand guidelines and they wanted to use them. And they really wanted to merge uh, technology, science and the human. Uh, later they brought human and science together. Um, so they had this cool storyboard which basically gave us good handles to understand what they meant. And that's actually where agencies can come in really handy because often uh, there's quite a bridge between the client and what they actually want. And that's kind of nice if someone else figures it out. Um, so the story is relatively simple. Um, we had this matter creation, then we grow some humans and some science. Uh, we don't grow actual humans, of course. Uh, then a path shapes these paths kind of intertwine, uh, actually then they should touch and afterwards they kind of grow together and emerge and form into a straight up logo. Um, so this is a good start uh, and after we get these kind of things we usually sit with the clients or actually in this case directly and we figure out hey is this feasible, um, what can we do, what are our own thoughts about it and we put something together. Uh, usually consisting of style shots and a animatic. Um, so we'll show the animatic here. So the animatic is just uh, the animation with some sound so that the client has an idea. And the style shots are really necessary because often clients can't look through these kind of animations. But it's important for them to also be aware of this in the beginning so that later um, feedback wise it's a lot easier but also no one is doing double work that way. Yeah, mostly internally for us, this is a very good way to, for example, time the music with the actual shots, uh, see, the motion, see the motion in real time uh, when it's actually out of cinema. Because if it's a heavy scene, you might have only a 15 FPS viewport or any number of problems. Uh, but like this, we can see it ourselves, we can show it to the client and hopefully get to a feedback round or not of course. But Yeah, and it, it helps a lot on also knowing that sometimes you see all these shots, you make a storyboard, you see 20 shots, you have your favorite and you end up spending about, uh, let's say, a whole day on it. And these kind of animatics make you realize sometimes that this shot only will be in the image for like two seconds. Uh, why waste that much time on it? Uh, you could do with a low res sim, let's say. Um, in this case, we won't dive into this project, but we'll just quickly show you the end result. Um, basically, all the particles are done in X-particles, by the way. So what we really like about uh, using X particles for these kind of productions is that you can put everything together in your host program already. So oftentimes you would do something in two different programs, let's say you use Houdini for particles and you use Cinema for the other workflows. It's a lot harder to tweak minor things, but as you do it all in one program, uh, you get to see everything in the scene view, as you saw in the animatic. and it just Time's a lot better and actually the whole look dev experience is so much better to be honest. Okay, another quick tip and this one is on hardware rendering. Uh, we use this to make quick animatics for our clients to give us feedback on camera motion, uh, the motion of objects, the speed of an animation and it helps us to really crank up our workflow speed uh, by a bunch because it's very fast. Uh, I'll quickly show you round. I have a simple animation. Uh, I have a focus object which is going from the one cube to the other. 
which is in my focus object in the camera and other than that it's basically shifting the vocal length and the camera is animated in position um, so that's all very simple um, for the hardware renderer you basically need to select it the hardware OpenGL and if you want to basically render it out like this um, you can just hit render uh, but I like to always tweak it a little bit um, and that's where the enhanced OpenGL comes in um, in your drop down menu and options you have a s you have some options you can select to make this hardware or your viewport a, bit, a little bit more pretty uh, for example you can switch on your shadows which basically gives this infinite light at shadows and if I wanted to I could also give this um, area light the shadow it has um, also you can switch on the depth of field so basically you see there there's a nice depth of field going on in the scene and if you would render this out it would be basically still the same uh, so you go into your settings and you switch on the depth of field and on the shadows render it again and basically you get a similar result uh, to get rid of these lines of the lights you can go into your filter and basically switch everything off and only switch on your polygons and now set this to depth of field on, shadows on if you have some glow or uh, reflections you can always switch those on too but that's not the case in this scene and if you want to, you can tweak the anti-aliasing but that will increase the render times by a bunch so now you can basically for now I switch off save select all frames and hit render yes I want to continue without saving and as you can see it basically renders it out yeah, within a second frame this is a way you can easily go back and forth with your client whether he likes a shot or not or the animation is too fast or too slow and like this you can have a quick playback of your animation and not render it out in Octane or Redshift or uh, in some cases uh, Cinema Standard or Physical Renderer so that always takes a while to render every frame and this is as you can see uh, 20 seconds for 240 frames which is fast and you can basically render out a full length animation of 5 minutes within a few minutes and get feedback on it okay uh, that's it for this quick tip thanks let's see what else have we got should we look at some more creative stuff um, basically yeah this project for us is the perfect bridge between basically our commercial work and the more creative free work we do uh, in our own time uh, mainly to learn to grow as an artist uh, but mainly to not having to do that learning part on client work because you always have this yeah, thing called a deadline and not wanting to cross it uh, and trying new things can be amazing for a project but it can also mean a project will not run so smoothly so there's two projects we, we picked in particular one up, oh, it's down actually so there's this kind of coral thing we did for an art exhibition uh, we need a big print on A0 I believe uh, 14 by 10,000 uh, pixels so pretty big task but yeah cinema doesn't really mind pixels 
uh, at some point your VRAM in Octane will run out, but this was still within the limits. Uh, quickly open this scene. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So, in essence, it's not too much going on in the scene itself. We have the mesh of the coral we generated within Cinema. Uh, we have some textures going on. Um, we did in Octane and we have of course the mighty sphere and as you can see for example here we added some nice little details and we'll show you after um, how much this detail matters when you're printing on this size so first I would like to show you how you can procedurally ish set this up in cinema um, so for starters we'll start out with a nice spline so sometimes these things can look kind of daunting because you see something like this I think if you hand model that that might be a crap ton of work um, but oftentimes there is a way to generate these kind of situations and cinema is particularly good at stacking those kind of things of course it started out with MoGraph um, and it just keeps on expanding those kind of tools and that on top of the shelf modeling tools makes it rather powerful so right now bus is um, basically sweeping again same like the tap but making quite a different result <laughs> I would like a tap like this yeah tap we're running, <laughs> running holes everywhere could be fun could be fun so yeah it's just a basic sweep yeah. then you might turn the caps off yeah so basically now indeed the caps is a good one but now I would like to add some detailing or some randomness actually to the the sweep we did and make it a little bit bigger uh, a lot bigger uh, that's bigger <laughs> yeah so basically we have something to work with uh, like Bart mentioned, uh, we're huge fans of MoGraph because it basically means we can generate rather than hand make things in cinema. Uh, in this case, we're going to use the Voronoi Fracture. Um, what it does is it, it uses the Voronoi Noise, which you might be familiar with, and generate that on mesh or in volume. Uh, and basically means that we can make things like coral. Um, it has a source which you can put point, uh, point distribution in or noises uh, and it basically has a point amount. Like when you take you can actually put like a this. lot of sources in so you could even put a, a MoGraph generator in there or you could model something you could use that. You could even use a spline to generate points. Um, now to basically invert this, because well, that's what we did, uh, we can offset to generate some space in between and afterwards invert it, which basically gives us the base of the coral system. And still, like this, it's still procedural, so you can move your input, you can put other things in there. If you remove the sweep altogether, you can put other objects in there like animals, a dog, whatever. Couches, um, anything. So the next step would be the volume mill builder and volume measure. The volume builder basically makes a volume, a point cloud out of the Vorino fracture actually out of anything you throw in there. Uh, for this we need to go a little bit lower in voxel size and add something to give it some thickness so it dilate, uh, dilate and erode. This gives it the required thickness we need to actually make some coral. Um, what we can do now is throw a smooth in there and basically that makes some coral 
and still if we would like to for example make these holes smaller you can go back into the Voronoi fracture go to sources go to the point generator and say okay I would like to have 250 and that was quicker than expected you have 250 points instead of 150 so now I quickly want to get to this render um, so yeah we basically printed this on 14 by 10k pixels so 140 megapixels ish and like you can see here you get all those little details and if you're in front of this hanging on a wall it looks amazing okay uh, then there's another a little bit bigger project we wanted to show you and that is the faces these two faces and it also uses the Voronoi fracture just a little bit of a different way so I'll quickly open up this one first go to my projects grass and basically like before we have a setup kind of straightforward some lights some backlights for reflections and background colors and the centerpiece the woman with a broken apart head so there's many ways in cinema how you can do this um, how I went to it is basically use the head and use physics to generate these pieces blowing out of the back of her head um, a more, more art directing way is to do it indeed within MoGraph and Bart will quickly show you how to set that up yeah. cool so um, let's take a look you might just do the same thing so Voronoi fracture and uh, Voronoi fracture actually anything MoGraph can be affected so let's do a simple plane effector we don't want it going up we're only going back to mimic the look of that and then anything that is a MoGraph effector has a fall of these days um, and those you can use pretty easily so you already see that you can direct this whatever way you would want um, pretty damn amazing and then you can just keep on stacking these things this is a simple plane it moves it from left to right uh, you add a bit of randomness to it you can use the same field for it so you apply that you choose what your randomness actually affects and you could of course stack anything you want but up, up, up and that way you have a lot of control I mean you can use different fields but you can see that uh, if you want to direct something you could actually put this together quite quickly um, interesting is this new push apart effector um, works point based not mesh based but it does a good job um, same story put the same field in there otherwise it starts disturbing everything and, and you might want to put it a bit more apart so this would be totally fine if you use a low poly mesh uh, or lo low parts actually in this case let's say uh, up into 100 there is a decent chance I get some intersections actually I think I'm cool no mm -hmm. we got an intersection so this is a nice prelude to what boss will do actually maybe it's interesting if you show yours first and then we show how we can mix them in the very end or you know, don't want to show the dynamic way yeah sure yeah then I was just checking time wise to only do yours oh okay if we're out of, we're out of time yeah yeah okay fair enough then um, I'll just combine this one so cool thing is uh, what Bas applied in the other scene so in this uh, there she is the head apart um, he applied dynamics and I actually use this often that I just apply a rigid body 
make sure that the seam dynamics are at zero percent because otherwise everything just drops to the floor um, and that way supposedly nope we missed something if i do this now we just have dynamics and the parts that intersect will just explode but of course as we want to be able to direct these things we have follow position and follow rotation which simply allow you to say hey this is already at this point i want to keep that point with a strength of 10 and if i press play now you see it just moves apart fixes your problem and you have this perfectly art directed piece if you want to you can of course stack all these things uh, if we had more time we'd show you a bit about mograph selection also working with fields um, but that's basically how you can do any kind of cool thing yeah. so basically that's also a bit of indeed the uh, workflow i applied uh, but i went for uh, indeed i did add it uh, add one of these dynamic body tags but then I basically went for just using an object like literally a bullet going from up to down, shooting through her head, it taking all the pieces in her in its way and blowing, blowing it out of the back of its head. Uh, to quickly go into the shot deeper. So like Bart mentioned, MoGraph basically allows you to add everything upon everything. Um, I also used that knowledge to basically generate the grass on the pieces of the head uh, and indeed also fields to limit that in the places that I didn't want it. So for example, in the shot, hey. no, you know this, huh? Ah, there it is. So, for example, the face, I didn't want any grass to grow. So, first of all, the handy thing about the Vorno fracture is that it has a selection tab. And basically, whatever you click on here or switch on here, it will basically give you a tag which you can later use to either add a texture on. So, in this case, the outside and the inside have different textures. Um, the I also generated the inside so I could generate some uh, vertex maps for it. So the scatter object, basically the cloner uh, we used for the grass knows where to grow grass and where not. And then also use a field so indeed the sphere around the head doesn't have any grass. And basically stacked upon that we also have a random field or random noise that a random effector, sorry, uh, that offsets that grass a little bit here and there, and then also a shader, which was literally a noise texture uh, for the distribution of the grass. So by stacking all those layers, you create some imperfection and detail that you would normally not get uh, when you do something either manual or just let grass grow everywhere uh, and I think that adds in the realism a lot and then if we would go to back to our PowerPoint so this was a quick project and if we quickly do this so this was all project within or yeah all the shots that came out of the same project to quickly wrap this up uh, in short, you can see here how much contrast in images you can get uh, by changing a few things here and there. Um, for the left two images, uh, was mainly changing what was cloned onto the uh, broken apart pieces. Uh, on the left, the grass was just changed into some cubes, um, added some tendrils to the head to get a completely different image than the middle image. Uh, the right image was the in-between where we basically started playing with these tendrils and afterwards they basically got combined to create uh, the left one. And 
that's the amazing thing about the whole MoGraph and cinema setup that you can quickly iterate between looks uh, and also um, get completely different yeah results with setups that are kind of similar so that wraps it up guys uh, thanks for listening today uh, I hope you had a bit of fun and you might have also picked up some techniques here and there uh, we won't expose too much of our entire workflows but uh, uh, this was a good look into it um, also thank you to Maxon uh, one for making this amazing piece of software we've been working in for quite a long time and two for giving us the opportunity to talk a bit about it and last but not least uh, we've all been invited to next year's IBC where we hopefully can do this all in real life once more yes. so hopefully see you guys there and otherwise uh, we might meet in the live session later today last but not least if you found this interesting or you want to just send us a message ask us anything about any of these topics and you didn't make the live session later then just hit us up on these platforms or uh, give us a ring here and there cool guys thanks a lot and uh, see you thanks. later